Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is the 1904 Cleveland Naps. 1904. I'm sorry. Today's topic is the 1904 Cleveland Naps AL MLB baseball season. Uh, again, the uh, Cleveland was playing in the American League. These are the early years of the American League, only the four, about the fifth year. The National League had been around for about uh, 30 years, and they were playing home games at League Park. Uh, the, 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 the Naps had a very strong year in 1904. Uh, they finished in fourth place with a record of 86 and 65, 21 games over, over 500. That's, that's tremendous. Winning percentage of 570. Only seven and a half games out of first, so we were a contender, and that's that's really uh, you know if you're a fan, that's what you want. You want your team to be a contender for the pennant. And so anyway, the uh, first place team in 1904 was the Boston Americans, later renamed the Red Sox, who were 95 and 59, winning percentage of 617. Second place, the New York Highlanders, who name was changed to the Yankees. So this was uh, you know, the beginning of the famous rivalry, Boston, New York, Red Sox, Yankees. Uh, in third place, the uh, Chicago White so- Sox were 89 and 65. They, they were no longer the White Stockings. They were the White Sox. Fourth place, the Cleveland Naps, 86 and 65. Fifth place, the Philadelphia Athletics, under the leadership of Connie Mack, were 81 and 70. Sixth place, the St. Louis Browns, 65 and 87. Seventh place, the Detroit Tigers, 62 and 90. And in uh, eighth place, the Washington Senators had a very tough year. Were 38 and 113, 55 and a half games out of first. Total attendance at League Park in 1904 was 264,749. That was that, that ranked sixth of the eight teams in the American League. It was down 47,000. So there was an average of 3,506 fans per game at League Park in Cleveland. There was no World Series in 1904, even though the um, uh, American League and National League were at peace. And it was based on a conflict between the New York Giants manager, John McGraw, and the American League president, Ben Johnson. So the National League champions, New York Giants, refused to play the American League champions, Boston Americans. Uh, no World Series. McGraw had this to say. He, was, uh, he said that the National League was, quote, the only real major league. So that was too bad. Uh, the, the Naps, Cleveland was in the pennant late race until July and before they faded. And they actually led the, led the league in hitting. Now, since there was no World Series, a uh, decision was made to have uh, a different postseason series. Uh, strangely enough, the two fourth-place teams in each league had played a postseason series. The fourth-place Cleveland Naps against the fourth-place um, uh, Pirates from, e- from each league, American League and National League. Kind of strange. And that was also part of the rivalry, the natural geographic rivalry between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, since they're close, and which we're f- very familiar with from the NFL rival- rivalry of the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was a five-game series, and it was also billed as Honus Wagner, the famous Pirates player against Napoleon Lajoie, the famous uh, Cleveland Naps player. Game one was at League Park. The battle of the fourth place teams and 4,000 fans came on October 10th for that game, which only went five innings because uh, it was a uh, rain shortened two to two tie. Honus Wagner hit a home run. Game two again was at League Park, and the Pirates won that game seven to four. Uh, game three was in Pittsburgh, and it was a three three tie that ended in after 14 innings because of darkness. So they had two ties. Game four, uh, Cleveland won three to two. And uh, game one, game five, Cleveland won four to one. So the Cleveland Naps won the battle of the fourth place teams in 1904. For the series, Honus Wagner hit 286 and Napoleon Lajoie 263. So that was below their um, career averages. The Naps had a strong pitching staff. Now in that uh, series, Bill Clem, who had been a minor league um, umpire, 
he uh, they, they they chose him to uh, to be the um, to be the umpire, Bill Clem, and uh, this was the beginning of his 35 years as a Major League Baseball umpire and eventual induction to the Hall Baseball Hall of Fame, Bill Clem. Now during the season, uh, the there was a game against the Browns in which the Naps made 10 errors, so that was kind of that was uh, troubling, and they lost a game against New York 21 to four. On July, tw- on July 22, the, uh, the Naps manager, uh, Bill Armour, uh, he, he, told, he said that uh, whoever was the winning pitcher uh, during that game could take a day off and watch a, an important boxing match of Bob Fitzsimmons against Jack O'Brien. So Bill Bernhardt said he, he'd pitch, and he, he pitched, and he won. So he got the prize. He got to watch that boxing match, which was apparently a big deal at the time, and he said it wasn't that great because they didn't punch that hard. Spring training was in San Antonio, Texas, and this actually became problematic. Two of the players got sick, and it really missed, missed considerable time, and they believed it was because of uh, dirty drinking water there. They stayed at the St. George Hotel, and the evenings they would gather in the uh, hotel lobby and have a, what they called a fanning bee. In other words, they were so hot they were fanning themselves. The Sporting Life wrote this in 1904 about uh, the Cleveland Naps, quote, There is no greater road attraction today than the Cleveland team. This is due partly to Lajue's personality, but more largely due to its great hitting ability, which always holds out to patrons the promise of action. So Bill Armour was back as manager. This was his uh, third and final year managing in Cleveland. And this was a, it was a tough year, apparently. They had, a, they had a strong record, but they were actually expected to, to win the title, and they did not. So there was report, reportedly the team was disorganized, discouraged, and there was dissension. And Bill Armour resigned on September 9th. He said, quote, I'm resigning, Charlie. He's talking about Charles Summers, the, the primary owner. This team doesn't want to be managed. Lajue isn't aggressive enough, although he's a great ball player. I'm through. So Napoleon Lajue was the acting manager for the rest of the season. Uh, Bill Armour thought that Lajue was diffident and too easygoing. Apparently he was. He was a nice fella, but tremendous talent. And he thought the players, uh, you know, they imitated Lajue, who was so talented, didn't need to actually exert himself or appear to exert himself because he had so much talent. But the other players really needed to. Now the regular lineup, uh, Harry Bemis was the uh, regular catcher. Bemis hit 226, 11 doubles, 6 triples, 25 RBIs, 6 stolen bases in 97 games. And Bemis was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1910. So he was his third year in eight years in Cleveland. Charlie Hickman was back at first base. Hickman hit 288, 22 doubles, 10 triples, 4 home runs, 45 RBIs, 9 stolen bases in 86 games. And Hickman uh, actually... Uh, left Cleveland after this year, but came back in 1908. Charlie Hickman, old piano legs. Napoleon Lajue was the star uh, second baseman for Cleveland, considered the best player in baseball. His average was 376. Wow, 49 doubles, holy cow, 15 triples, 5 home runs, 102 RBIs, 29 stolen bases in 140 games. And of course, Lajue was uh, in the third year. He played 12 years for Cleveland. He was American League batting champion. <coughs> and, of course, after the season, he, you know, he managed the, the last three weeks of the season. And after the season, he was named the new manager for the following year. He led the American League in hits, doubles, total bases, and RBIs. Now, there was a game in Chicago. Lajue was ejected for flinging a a molded wad of chewing tobacco in the face of the umpire. He did have problems with his uh, losing his temper from time to time, even though he was an easygoing guy. Uh, the, the St. Louis uh, in St. Louis, the Naps were there for a game against the Browns or a series, and uh, they called the team the Lajue's Fence Breakers, the Cleveland Naps. And, uh, and there was a game there. Lajue went five for five, five hits and five at bats. The St. Louis Republic newspaper wrote, "Quote." Lajue, as befits his dignity as captain, led his team with the willow. Willow meaning the bat, wooden bat, well, like a willow tree. Five hits were all he made, but he can be excused for not doing better as he faced the pitcher only five times. 
and when one considers that two of his hits were doubles, his performance is altogether satisfactory to all concerned except the pitchers. Interesting uh, commentary. On July 13th, Lajue had three triples against the New York Highlanders. That, that tied a record. In September, Lajue, uh, uh, there was a pitch out and a runner on first. Um, they were expecting a stolen base, so they had a pitch out, and, uh, which was way outside. And Lajue reached out across the plate and hit a home run on a pitch out. Wow. And after uh, he was named manager, it was reported that he would also be responsible for signing the players and making trades. In other words, he'd be the general manager. So that was really something. The old days. Uh, our shortstop in 1904 was Terry Turner. We had a new shortstop. Turner hit 235, nine doubles, six triples, a home run, 45 RBIs, five stolen bases in 111 games. Turner was from Sandy Lake, Pennsylvania. Died in Cleveland, Ohio, 1960 at age 79. Career average of 253, eight home runs, and 528 RBIs, and 256 stolen bases. Turner played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, Cleveland Naps, Cleveland Indians, and Philadelphia Athletics between 1901 and 1919. And he's with Cleveland from 1904 to 1918, so 14 years in Cleveland. They called him Cotton Top. He was five foot eight, a line drive hitter, and a fearless base stealer. And the nor- normal slides hurt his ankles, so he became a pioneer of the head first slide. Mostly a shortstop, he would play third base as well. He broke up three no hitters in his career. He set the team record with 1,619 games played. His career high average was 308 in 1912. Between 1906 and 1911, he averaged 26 stolen bases a season and had a career high of 31 stolen bases in 1910. He led the American League shortstops in fielding percentage four times. He's the team all-time putout leader, 4,603. A putout is when you throw, like mostly throw into first to get the runner out on a ground ball. Uh, for 77 years, Terry Turner was the Cleveland career stolen base leader with 254. That was broken by Kenny Loft in 1996 and, and then um, Omar Vizquel in 2003. Turner is buried in the, in the Knollwood Cemetery in Mayfield Heights, Ohio, in the Cleveland area. In 2001, he was selected as one of the 100 greatest Cleveland Indians of all time during the 100th anniversary celebration. During the season, he had typhoid fever and missed 40 games. That was because of the uh, problems with uh, the drinking water in in San Antonio, Texas during spring training. Uh, Gordon Cobbledick wrote, uh, well, they eventually had the Gordon Cobbledick Award. Uh, Gordon Cobbledick, Cleveland sports writer, wrote, quote, of Turner, that he was, quote, a little rabbit of a man with the guts of a commando. And that uh, fever was, he had typhoid fever early in the season, which was life-threatening. He almost died. Thank goodness he survived. Tremendous player, Terry Turner. Bill Bradley was back at third base. Bradley had another fine year. Bradley had 332 doubles, eight triples, six home runs, 83 RBIs, 23 stolen bases, and 154 games. And Bradley played for Cleveland from 1901 to 1910. Elmer Flick was in the was a regular outfielder. Flick hit 306. Good hitter, 31 doubles, 17 triples, 6 home runs, 56 RBIs, 38 stolen bases, and 150 games. And Flick played for Cleveland from 1902 to 1910, so he had a good run here in Cleveland. Billy, Billy Lush was a new regular outfielder. Lush hit 258, 13 doubles, 8 triples, a home run, 50 RBIs, 12 stolen bases, and 138 games. Lush was from Bridgeport, Connecticut. He died in Hawthorne, New York in 1951 at age 77. Career average of 249, 8 home runs, 152 RBIs. Lush played for the Washington Senators, Boston Bean Eaters, Detroit Tigers, and Cleveland Naps between 1895 and 1904. He was, the base, he was a baseball and basketball coach at Yale University, also Columbia University, Fordham University, the United States Naval Academy, St. John's University, the University of Baltimore, and Trinity College, and Hartford. So he had quite a, quite a career after his playing career was over, coaching in college. 
In the 1930s, he coached athletic teams at Sing Sing Prison in Austin, New York. His father worked in a sewing machine factory when he was growing up. And in 1930, Billy Lush was a cigar maker working in a cigar factory. Interesting fellow, Billy Lush. Harry Bay was another regular outfielder. Bay hit 241, 12 doubles, 9 triples, 3 home runs, 36 RBIs, 38 stolen bases in 132 games. And Bay played for Cleveland from 1902 to 1908. Harry Bay. Now, the bench players included George Stovall, who was a who was a first baseman. Stovall hit 298, 10 doubles, a triple, a home run, 31 RBIs, three stolen bases in 52 games. Stovall was from Leeds, Missouri. He died in Burlington, Iowa, 1951 at age 73. Career average of 265, 15 home runs, 564 RBIs. Stovall played for the Cleveland Naps, St. Louis Browns, and Kansas City Packers between 1904 and 1915. He was a player manager for the Cleveland Naps, St. Louis Browns, and Kansas City Packers between 1911 and 1915. They called him Firebrand. He had a temper. Uh, the Packers, that team was in the Federal League, a new, uh, new league that came a little, little bit later. And George Stovall had 142 career uh, stolen bases. In 1911, he organized a strike among the players so they could attend the funeral of Addie Joss, and as a result, opening day was postponed. The baseball, baseball magazine wrote this about George Stovall, quote, There is a homely grace in his six feet one of solid tendon and muscle. There is an impressive power in his firm, protruding jaw, a seasoned endurance in his physical makeup. He has a keen brain, ready wit, a blunt philosophy, but he is no man to be trifled with. George Stovall. Fred Abbott was a spare catcher. Abbott hit 169, 22 hits, 4 doubles, 2 triples, 12 RBIs, 2 stolen bases in 41 games. And uh, this was his second and last year in Cleveland. Fred Abbott. Fritz Bulow was another spare catcher. Bulow hit 176, 21 hits, 4 doubles, a triple, 5 RBIs, 2 stolen bases in 42 games. Bulow was from Berlin, Germany in Europe. He died in Detroit, Michigan in 1933 at age 57. Career average of 192, 6 home runs, 112 RBIs. Bulow played for the St. Louis Perfectos, St. Louis Cardinals, Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Naps, and St. Louis Browns. Excuse me, between 1899 and 1907. He was also called Fred Bulow. He was a solid defensive catcher. In 1906, he led American League catchers with throwing out attempted base runners with 54.2% uh, uh, success rate. He developed locomotor ataxia, uh, which is the inability to, to have precise control of body movement as an older man, which means you end up walking in a jerk, jerky manner. Charlie Bulow. Charlie Carr was a spare first baseman. Carr hit 225, 27 hits, 5 doubles, a triple, 7 RBIs in 32 games. Carr was from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. He died in Memphis, Tennessee in 1932 at age 55. Career average of 252, 6 home runs, and 240 RBIs. Carr played for the Washington Senators, Philadelphia Athletics, Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Naps, Cincinnati Reds, and Indianapolis Hoosiers between 1898 and 1914. After his playing career, he had a successful uh, sporting goods manufacturing business called Bradley and Carr. They supplied baseballs to several minor baseball leagues. Charlie Carr. Bill Schwartz was another spare first baseman. Schwartz hit 151, 13 hits, two doubles, four stolen bases in 24 games. Schwartz was from Cleveland, Ohio. He died in Nashville, Tennessee in 1961 at age 77. And his MLB career was just with the Cleveland Naps in 1904. After that, he coached the Nashville Vols in the Southern Association in the minor leagues from 1911 to 1915. Bill Schwartz. Claude Rossman was an outfielder who hit 210, 13 hits, 5 doubles, 6 RBIs in 18 games. Rossman was from Philmont, New York. He died in Poughkeepsie, New York in 1928 at age 46. Career average of 283, 3 home runs, and 238 RBIs. 
Rossman played for the Cleveland Naps, Detroit Tigers, St. Louis Browns between 1904 and 1909. He won three American League titles with the Tigers between 1907 and 1909. Also lost three World Series. In the 1907 World Series, he hit 474. He had, a, he had a peculiar emotional quirk. Sometimes Rossman would freeze and could not throw the ball when he was excited. So sometimes the runners on first base, they, would, they knew about this, so they would get a really big lead, which would draw a throw, and then they'd take off for second, and Rossman was unable to make the throw. He'd just hold on to the ball. This shortened his career. He was 28 during his last MLB game. He died at the Hudson River State Hospital for the Insane and had been a patient there for several years. So that was really tragic. You know, he had this, uh, his last, he hit 474 in the 1907 World Series and was out of baseball two years later. Claude Rossman. Rube Vinson was another outfielder. Vinson hit 306, 15 hits, a double, two RBIs, two stolen bases in 15 games. Vincent was from Dover, Delaware, died in Chester, Pennsylvania in 1951 at age 72. Career average of 227 with 14 R- RBIs. Vincent played for the Cleveland Naps and Chicago White Sox between 1904 and 1906. His given name was Ernest Augustus, named after the uh, Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. In 1951, Vincent fell from a two-story building while washing a window, and this led to his death. So he was 72 years old, washing the window, had that tragic fall. Rube Vinson. Harry Ostdiek was, a, was another catcher. Ostdiek hit 167, three hits, a triple, three RBIs, a stolen base in seven games. Ostdiek was from Ottumwa, Iowa. I think Radar O'Reilly from MASH was from Ottumwa, Iowa. TV show in the 70s. Ostdiek died in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1956 at age 75. He had a career average of 143 with three RBIs, a run scored, and a triple. He played for the Cleveland Naps in 1904 and the Boston Red Sox in 1908, Harry Ostdiek. Mike Donovan was a shortstop third baseman, got in two games, batted twice, did not get a hit, had a walk. Donovan was from Brooklyn, New York. He died in New York, New York in 1938 at age 56. Career average was of 235 with two RBIs. Donovan played for the Cleveland Naps in 1904 and the New York Highlanders in 1908. He worked as a security guard for Consolidated Edison and was shot and died when a co-worker's gun accidentally discharged Mike Donovan. Now the pitching staff, our ace pitcher, was the incredible future Hall of Famer Addie Joss. Joss wasn't much of a hitter. He hit 132, 10 hits, a triple, 3 RBIs in 28 games. He was a very tall guy, had a big strike zone. His record as a pitcher was 14 and 10 with, a, with an incredible ERA of 1.59, 24 starts, 20 complete games, and five shutouts. Josh pitched for Cleveland from 1902 to 1910. He had the lowest ERA in the league, and Josh, was, Josh asked what he did after pitching a bad game, and he said that the next morning, the, the morning after, he said, well, that morning, I don't read the newspapers. <laughs> he missed five weeks with a fever. That's why he, you know, his, he didn't win that. He only won 14 games. And he was another guy like the, um, that Terry Turner. They both got sick, probably from uh, dirty drinking water in San Antonio, Texas, in, uh, in, during spring training. He also suffered from a lack of run support. He lost three one to nothing games. Addie Joss. Bill Bernhard was another tremendous pitch, starting pitcher. Bernhard hit 177, 22 hits, four doubles, a triple, 13 RBIs, a stolen base in 38 games. Bernhard's pitching record was 23 and 13. Well, that's really that's tr- really incredible. And an ERA of 2.13, also outstanding. 37 starts, 35 complete games, and four shutouts. And Bernhard pitched for Cleveland from 1902 to 1907. Bill Bernhard. Red Donahue was another tr- incredible starting pitcher. Donahue hit 168, 17 hits, four doubles, eight RBIs, two stolen bases in 35 games. Donahue's pitching record was 19 and 14, with an ERA of 2.40. 32 starts, 30 complete games, six shutouts. Donahue pitched for Cleveland from 1903 to 1905. So you can see those first three starting pitchers for Cleveland 
were outstanding, although we lost Joss for more than a month. Red Donahue. Another starting pitcher was Otto Hess. Hess hit 120, 12 hits, two doubles, a triple, five RBIs in 34 games. Hess's pitching record was 8-7 and seven, with, an, with an incredible ERA, ERA of 1.67. 16 starts, 15 complete games, and four shutouts. And Hess was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1908. Otto Hess. Earl Moore was another fine starting pitcher. Moore hit 140, 12 hits, three doubles, two RBIs, a stolen base in 26 games. Moore's pitching record was 12 and 11, with a very fine ERA of 2.25, 24 starts, 22 complete games, and a shutout. And he was with Cleveland from 1901 to 1907. Earl Moore. Bob Dusty Rhodes was another pitcher. He hit 196, 18 hits, two doubles, two triples, 14 RBIs in 29 games. Rhodes' uh, pitching record was 10 and 9 with an ERA of 2.87, 19 starts, 18 complete games, and Rhodes pitched for Cleveland from 1903 to 1909. Bob Dusty Rhodes. And finally, Jack Hickey was another pitcher. Hickey got in two games, batted five times, did not get a hit, struck out twice. Pitching record of 0 and 1 with an ERA of 7.30, two starts and a, one complete game. Hickey was from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He died in Seattle, Washington in 1941 at age 60. And his MLB career was just with the Cleveland Naps in 1904. So that's the story of the 1904 Cleveland Naps who were a contender. And uh, we had Napoleon Lajue. We had a lot of good hitting. We, had, we, we could run. And the pitching staff was, was tremendous. So it was an exciting time to be a Cleveland baseball fan in 1904. God bless the fellows who played for the Cleveland Naps in 1904, and everyone else associated with the team, including the vendors, security guards, and so forth, ticket takers, and, uh, and, and, the, and, and including the fans, especially the Civil War veterans and the Spanish-American War veterans, captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, First Energy Stadium friends, Progressive Field pals, Quicken Loans Arena enthusiasts, Severance Hall stalwarts, Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, and Gladiators rule Cleveland, City of Champions. It's been 70 years since 1948. This is our year. Go Tribe. Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.